<clears throat> Hello, friends. Welcome to the Shaman's View. I believe we are live. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the Shaman's View. I'm Dr. Alberto Violdo with the View from the Invisible World. Today, I'd like to speak to you about the Oracle. The Oracle, Oracles have existed in every culture and in every tradition in the world. Even in Judaism, you find, which is a very, very kind of strict religion in the sense of not having any, um, any other gods other than the, the, than the God that's been revealed to us in the Bible. Even in Judaism, you find that the oracle is permitted to give you a yes or no answer. Very, very old tradition. Not very much practice today. <clears throat> The oracle gives us guidance, but the oracle is not only about divining what's going to happen, but it's about making divine, making yourself divine. I remember an old shaman saying to me one time, we were hiking through the Altiplano in the Andes, <clears throat> and he said to me, you know, Alberto, we did not come here to grow corn only. We came here to grow gods. We came here to grow gods, to develop that divine quality within us where we can co-create, where we can dream the world into being. Divining, unfortunately, has really been reduced to fortune-telling and soothsaying and what's going to happen tomorrow when it's really truly about our connecting with the archetypes with the ancient forces of creation. The archetypes are a term developed by Carl Jung that, in a way, Jung's work was fantastic because he took the very animistic worldview of the ancients and turned it into psychology, into modern psychology. So the gods became the archetypes. The, the divine realms became the collective unconscious. He gave us a terminology that allowed us to continue to relate to these ancient forces in an elegant way and learn how they, they guide us in our lives and learn what happens when we become possessed by one of the gods, by one of the archetypes, and how to free ourselves from this kind of possession. I want to talk to you briefly about one of the old gods of Greece, and this was the son of Aphrodite. This was Eros, the god of love. And if you were pricked by one of Eros's arrows, you were lost. All of the gods in Olympus dreaded, they dreaded Eros because they knew that the way of love was the most difficult way to acquire wisdom, the most challenging, the quickest path to get you to heaven and the fastest road to get you to hell, and even to that place where you weren't sure if you were in heaven in the evening and in hell the next morning. <laughs> so this was the most feared and dreaded of the gods. It was the god of eros, of eroticism and love. But the archetypes are ancient forces that the Greeks personified as gods, but the shamans are pre-anthropomorphizing these forces. Before we turn the gods into human-like figures, the shamans describe them as the great forces of the universe that operate within us too, in the same way that gravity operates within us, that the laws of physics work with the electrons and the protons and the molecules in our body, the laws of biology operate within us. Also, the cosmic laws of the powers of creation are at work within us. And as shamans, we need to be able to dance with these forces in a way that's creative. And if we don't dance with our creativity with them, we find that we become subject to them in a way that is rather unpleasant, in a way that we are begin to lose our personal initiative and free will. 
So what I'd like to do today is to invite you to find what, uh, which one of these forces, what God is, is influencing your life at the most. Is it, is it the God of war? Is it Mars? Is it God of love? Is it Venus? Is it, is it, what is it that it, are the forces that are most at play in your life? Are you going through a great deal of anxiety, of restlessness? Are you feeling caged in? Are you feeling like you need to contain yourself a little bit more and go within? These are forces that psychology tried to provide a name for and has not done such a great job that are better to examine from the point of view of the archetypes, of archetypal or deep psychology, or better even yet from the perspective of magic. Now for some of us, there's certain archetypes that have been really prevalent. Like in my own life, psyche, the, the innocent feminine, has been a really prevalent theme in my life, how I need to go back to that innocent feminine quality in myself to get the right kind of instinct operating, to get the right kind of guidance, to cultivate a kind of not knowingness that for me is really important. Now I know people that are just in the opposite side of that, of that um, spectrum, where they're more working with the energies of Aphrodite, of the ancient feminine that is wise and all-knowing, but that leaves very little room for naiveness, for newness, <clears throat> that leaves a very, very little space for not knowing, for discovering the new. And there's really, truly nothing quite as boring as having dinner with someone we all know people like this that know everything, that are authorities, that have become masters at their domain and their world, they think, because they're basically hiding underneath the veils of their own accumulation of data that is not truly wisdom. Nothing as pedantic as somebody who's telling you about their greatest, newest discovery about who they are or about the nature of reality. It gets really old, doesn't it? So find out which archetype is most prevalent within you and how you want to take that archetype into the dance floor. Which one of the gods are you engaging in the dance? Is it Artemis, the huntress? Is it now, we don't have these names anymore available to us. We only have their psychological description. And is it a restlessness that's inside of you that's calling you to explore maybe a different relationship than the one you're in? Maybe to become a little bit risky in the contact that you're having with someone to, that you're really asking them to help you step out of the very small box that you've brought yourself into. <clears throat> when we become aware of these forces, we don't confuse them for reality. We know that they are the forces that organize the reality that we meet in the world. And these forces are largely unconscious. They go into that realm that the Carl Jung called the shadow, that is that 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 which lies beneath the surface, that part of the glacier that we can see only the tip of, and we know that 90% of it is below the waters. This is what sank the Titanic and what will sink us when we're not aware of the tremendous power that these archetypes have. So today I'd like to speak about four archetypes in particular. <clears throat> I like to speak about the prince and the princess. So many of us begin lives as, as princes. We are, we're gifted, we are recognized as talented. Things go well for us. We have good luck. And then we become attached to that archetype. The princess is one of the great archetypes. The seductive, the seductress, the one that can manipulate life and with her beauty, her power, her wit, and her youth. 
but princesses don't age very gracefully. You've got to become queenly. And that's a different, difficult archetype to transit through. How do you leave the princess to become the queen? And the queen is stately. The queen is regal. The queen has a beauty that is not the beauty of adolescence. It's the beauty of maturity and of years. The queen has a beauty of, that is born of wisdom <clears throat> and a power that's not based on seduction, but in the deep understanding and comprehension of how fragile life is and how resilient and powerful humans are and can be. Let me take us to another archetype for the men, the warrior. <clears throat> As men, we're trained to go out into the world, to make our mark in the world, to find what we want and to go out and get it. And we measure our success by how many heads we've taken or how much money we've made or how much fame or fortune or how much we're recognized by the general or by our bosses or by daddy. And then we find that at the end of our lives, we've got the suit of armor on that we haven't let anyone know who we are for the last 20 years to the point that even we've forgotten who we are. <clears throat> and so the warrior must take the armor off, must put the sword down, must step out of the world of doing and step into the world of being. And if the warrior cannot do that, he will die. And this is not only the men, but remember we have, these are masculine and feminine archetypes, that each one of us has a masculine and a feminine side, even if you are male or female. And the warrior is exhausted in so many of us. We're so tired of trying to make our mark whether it be through our social media presence or through our marketing videos or through our website or through that persona that we put in, put on in the morning and that we have begun to believe it's truly us. The warrior must put his sword down. Your inner warrior must stop looking for battles so that he can find meaning through victory but begins to find meaning through defeat, to surrender, I surrender, and begins to understand that surrendering doesn't mean giving up. Surrendering means you have to stop controlling. You have to stop manipulating reality to try to get the outcome that you want to happen. In fact, the best way to get what you want to happen is by not doing anything to make that happen but by being it and becoming it. I remember in the, my early days in the high Andes studying the shamans. I was a young medical anthropologist and I was filming the shamans and the young shamans were amazing to watch. They would have their feathers and their rattles and they would take their feathers and work on the person they were working with and healing. And then they would take the rattles and cast them. And then the old medicine people, I remember this old medicine woman, I was filming her, and she was working on helping someone or healing someone, and she went, and I said to her, would you mind doing that again so I can get another shot? She went, and I asked her, why, are you, why don't you do like the young women do, or the young men with the feathers and the rattles? And she says, ah. They do that because they're still learning. When you get really good, the old woman said, you don't even need to do that anymore. You just simply be and life happens. This is such a difficult transit for that warrior that's accustomed to having things happen as a result of their effort and they cannot stop efforting. The king, Let's go to the king for a moment. We went from the princess to the queen. The warrior has to become the sage. The king has to become that card in the tarot, in the tarot deck called the Hierophant. 
the embodiment of wisdom. Otherwise, the king is only the ruler. It's only the one that is at the top of the ladder. Now, the problem with kings is that they always had to keep someone at their side to taste the wine and taste the food to see that no one was trying to poison them. And inevitably, you know that the younger masculine, that the prince, that was going to take your life, to take your place. And that if the fields were not fertile, that you would be offered a sacrifice, that you had to produce for the entire kingdom, for the entire family, for the whole household, for the whole company. It all depended on you, and the more talented you were, the more duty and the more responsibility and the more money that you got, but the less life force and the less heart that was in your life. So the king usually dies of loneliness or is poisoned by those closest to him. That wonderful scene where Julius Caesar, Caesar the emperor, says to Brutus, his ally, his friend, et tu Brutus, and you too, my friend, you too have kept me in this role and kept me from becoming free. The king has to become the hierophant, the embodiment of wisdom. Otherwise, that kingly part of ourselves, when it begins to get old, will try to exert increasing control to get the world to behave according to his will of your own inner king and will result in harm for the entire kingdom. The final archetype I'd like to touch on is that of the child, of the eternal child, of the beautiful child. The child is the one that everyone loves, the innocent. And this is the beauty of the great myth of Christianity, is the arrival of the child, of the divine child that has come to redeem us. And the child is the one who becomes the father to the man, becomes the father to the mother even. But the, the child has to go through the rites of passage, of maturing without losing innocence. And this is that inner child that we have within each one of us. We've all read the books and have heard about the inner child for decades to the point of, don't talk to me anymore about my inner child. But the inner child is the divine child. <clears throat> that is born within each one of us and is born during the times of greatest difficulty, of greatest challenge. The inner child is not the result of a week of lovemaking in a beautiful island in the Pacific. <clears throat> the inner child is born in a manger, as in Christianity. <clears throat> born in a manger. It's born with the animals. It's born in nature. And it's the innocent, and it's a recovery of our innocence today of that divine child, not the inner child that we have to heal because was wounded during the course of our lives, but the inner Christ, the inner Buddha, the divine child within each one of us, that in this time of great challenge and hardship must be born in nature, <clears throat> in within our own nature, within our own mangers, within our own wild places, so that this child can help us return to our innocence. So as you do your fire ceremony this evening, the fire ceremony we've been doing together, as you do your fire ceremony, I'd like you to place that inner child in the fire, that divine child. Place it in the fire and take the flames of that fire to warm and heat that seed of that divine child within you, within your belly, your womb, within your heart, and within your forehead. <clears throat> that divine child is so ready to be born today. Among the indigenous peoples of the Andes, this is talked about as the prophecies of Pachacuti, of the end of time. The end of time is the end of an era, and the end of a humanity as we know it. It's the returning the world 
turning the world back upright as it needs to be again. And this is a terrible process. It means the dying of the old, the mulching of what doesn't work. We're right in the midst of that. But at this time, also, that divine child is being born. And it's not going to be at the physical, literal level with the new rainbow children or the new whatever generation. It's going to be within each one of us that we need to birth that innocent one, which is that divinity awakening within us that can return us to our innocence, to our newness, to break out of that place of been there, done that, and to step into that relationship with life of never been there, never done that before, of newness. Innocence is the key. And the birthing of this divine principle, that child within each one of us, that archetype, that power that is so ready to be expressed through you and through me today, so ready to be born, that we become that vessel and that vehicle for it. And this is where that myth of the divine birth happening, of the pure, the immaculate conception, where we can be fertilized with that seed directly by spirit. And we carry that seed within us, within our energetic womb, men and women, that we become the vessel and the vehicle and provide the body for that divine child is so ready to be born. Thank you for joining me today in The Shaman's View. And I hope that um, you take this to the fire tonight because we are in that place in that cycle of prophecy where the birth is ready to begin happening. The first birds of springtime are beginning to sing in the Northern Hemisphere. In the South, everything is as it should be in the middle of the heat of the summer. But now is the time in that great cycle of creation for us to become the, the vehicles for this new form of the divine.